One Plus One Production presents, supported by Ministry of Information Policy of Ukraine, a film by Akim Galimov, director Daria Sarycheva, camera Serhii Donskich, chief editor Ruslan Shapiro. Historical consultant Oleksiy Sokirko. Executive producer Volodymyr Andriyuk. General producers Akim Galimov and Oleksandr Tkachenko. National treasures, Ukraine, returning our history. On January 21st, 1803, a mysterious doctor arrived at Kozak capital Baturin. His task was of utmost importance to prepare the body of the last hetman for a funeral. A clandestine procedure had a few participants. They took out the heart from the body, embalmed it and buried it in a lead box. This box was never supposed to see the light of the day. But the ancient law was broken. The relic, symboling the majestic Hetman era, disappeared. A faded photo was the only reminder of a priceless artifact that could reveal a grand epoch better than any textbook. This picture is the only crime evidence. At the time, other artifacts of Cossack Hetmans were disappearing in Ukraine. Symbols of their power and independence, maces, under which Cossacks united as one powerful force, who hid the national treasures and turned the protagonists of our history into abstract figures from the past. Nowadays even presidents take their oath with a souvenir mace. We don't have any authentic artifact of this kind to symbolize Ukrainians' historical path to independence. The box with the heart of the last hetman is a chance to bring our history back. It can show us the way to the other lost national treasures. I'm flying to Austria to see the person who might know where the relic is. My name is Akim Halimo. I am a history researcher. My colleague Ruslan Shapiro, I unravel the past mysteries and debunk the myths instilled in Ukrainians for centuries. Secret Department. Our strength is a team of professional experts in cutting-edge technologies that open new facts about Ukraine. Great. This investigation is about Cossacks. We have a history of 17th, 18th centuries here. Few discrepancies in the well-known facts led us to unprecedented results. Kozak's history was falsified. First of all, it was massive. We were allowed to know this small part. Most of Ukrainians believe they are the descendants of Kozaks. Their lives, houses, appearances. Friends and foes were different. We were pretty narrow-minded. We go on a mission to find the nation's heart. In these estates they kept symbols of power. We will search for the legendary hetman relics that remind us of our past. Half tone of golden and silver items? The crown of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Amazing. It's pure gold. Pure gold? Yes. 78 diamonds? There are some hints in the famous books. First one word, and then the whole paragraph. That's right, yes, yes. We will discover secret places that historians thought were hoaxes. We can do this. Let's see. We will expose the falsifications that should have hidden the traces. This maze has nothing to do with Bogdan Khmelnytsky. For the first time in Ukrainian history, we will decode the ancient letter that puzzled scholars for decades. We can clearly see the word Kozak here. Kozak? The traces of the national treasures will lead us to Austria, Poland, Turkey and the US. I have access to unique sources. Khmelnytsky. 
we will solve the biggest mystery in history. What was in the fateful agreement between Bogdan Khmelnytsky and Moscow Tsar? This information is classified. This will change everything. The heart of one person can return the whole nation's history. Oh my God! This is fantastic. It's not a legend. Yes, now it's not a legend. Kirill Razumovsky is the central figure of our investigation. Europe has a history of rulers represented in sources, architecture and people's memory. In Ukraine the name of the last hetman is not very well known. His brother Oleksiy is more famous. He was the husband of the Russian Empress Elizaveta. But Kirillo was an extraordinary person. When he was 17 he became the president of the Russian Academy of Sciences. When he was 22 he became Ukrainian hetman. His direct descendant, a historian by profession, Count Reho Razumovsky, lives in Vienna. Many people will find this funny, because I don't speak Ukrainian, but I feel Ukrainian. I've grown up on the history of my family, my ancestors. I want to show you a few photos we've talked about. Did you ever see them? No. This is your grand-grandfather's script. These pictures are shocking. You can even see the skull. I have a strange feeling looking at them. It is very personal to see these pictures. Do you know where is this box now? No, I have no idea. So the crypt was opened without relatives' consent. This would be the only valid reason to exhume the headman's body. There are many secrets and mysteries kept in the dark. The chest with the headman's heart is not just an old artifact. There was a tradition to put the hearts of the French and English kings in similar boxes as a sign of the utmost respect. In Britain, the chest with King Richard's heart is one of the most precious national treasures. Ukrainian relic has the same meaning for us. That's why it is so important to know where it's gone. So many open questions, which I have to answer. Gregor checks the family archive to ensure he don't miss anything before. He finds a clue in one of the diaries. It can help answer the questions of who might have taken the heart. Thanks to my grandfather, who knew all the stories told in the family. I found out that Kirillo Razumovsky tried to find the original of the Periaslav Treaty. And he was looking for the originals of the Periaslav Treaty? Yes. And also Khmelnytsky's relic, a mace. Why was Razumovsky interested in the founder of the Cossack state? Why was he looking for his symbols of the power and the fateful treaty that made Ukraine a part of Russia for three centuries? How is Khmelnytsky and his relics connected with the disappeared heart? In Austria, we get more questions than answers. We start a new investigation. Gregor wants to solve family mysteries and find a chest with his ancestor's heart. Our team will follow the traces of the last hetman to find the mace of Bogdan Khmelnytsky and revive erased history. Baturin is the first step in Gregor's investigation. It was the last hetman's residence, and the crypt with a buried heart was also here. We meet with Natalia Ribrova, director of the reserve hetman's capital. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Let's go. This is a crime scene. 
1927, a group of people entered the church. They dumped a tombstone, broke a wooden floor and got into the church dungeon. Who was that? And why would they destroy the grave? We have records of the crypt's opening. This document is from the summer of 1927. The grave of the last hetman was opened by the special commission. They took out his personal belongings, his silver coat of arms and something they wanted the most. The heart in the metallic box was taken out of the grave by the Konotop Museum. This was the last time these things were seen. Natalia Rebrova tells Gregor that local historians did their own investigation. They found out that the Konotop Museum was never exhibited the heart. It is not in the repository either. The relic wasn't even registered there. Where are all these things? We cannot trace them in the documents of the Konotop Museum. It seems that the Konotop Museum was a cover-up for a theft. The trace is lost. We have a family legend that Kirillo was looking and collecting things of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Was there his mace in the crypt? There were many witnesses when they opened the crypt. They do not mention the mace. Today there are no authentic hetman maces in Ukraine. In Hetman's palace in Baturin, they have only a modern replica of the mace given to Razumovsky as a present from the Empress. Hetman had his own valuable symbol of power, so why would he look for Khmelnytsky's mace? We can answer this question if we find this old relic. But first, we have to find out what it looked like. Historian Maxim Ostapenko can help us with this. Hi, Maxim. Hello, welcome. We go to the National Art Museum. These two paintings will give you the best impression of this mace. This portrait of the 18th century and an icon, perhaps made in Khmelnytsky's lifetime. This is an important detail. The icon was painted in Hetman's lifetime, so the mace could have possibly looked like that. It looks like it was made of gold. The mace cost a fortune, and it was made by the most skillful craftsmen. Such talent was unique. So it was golden or gilded, inlaid with jewels, and had a handle made of rare redwood. This is an emblem of the state. It symbolizes the nation's self-determination as a powerful force. This mace was different from the other power symbols. Under it, Bogdan Khmelnytsky united disparate Cossack groups and instilled the idea they weren't even able to fathom at the time. The idea of the Ukrainian state. Tell me. Where this mace could be today? Where do we start the search? You should check two possibilities. First, Cossacks might have hidden it somewhere near Subotiv. The second, more popular version, says it was taken to Poland with the other military trophies during the ruin period. So we have two destinations, Poland and Ukraine. That's right. Ruslan started collecting information about Bogdan Khmelnytsky. He found out that the Mykola Hohol wanted to write a novel about this hetman, but he never finished the book for unknown reasons. Except for the first chapter, no one had ever seen the rest of the book. There's an interesting detail in this story. For a short time Hohol was working in Petersburg in the Tsarist secret police, similar to today's FSB. He had access to classified historical documents. 
He might have found something significant there. We visited a writer's family estate to find out what that was. Katerina Chernova, a collection custodian, waits for Ruslan there. Hi. Good afternoon. Mikola Hohl started a novel called Hetman and even wrote a few chapters. Where is the rest? He never finished the novel. While contemplating this idea, Hohl was actively working on a book about the history of Ukraine. He even knew the length. It should have been four large volumes or six smaller ones. I didn't know Hohl was writing the history of Ukraine. This is new information in our investigation. Hohl planned to write a profound history book. He says, I want to write the history of our poor Ukraine, one and only, and tell the things no one else has said. Why? He didn't finish the history as well and never implemented his idea. This is strange. He starts writing a novel about Hetman and doesn't finish it. He starts writing the history of Ukraine and doesn't finish it either. Why? I want to show you how Hohol was treated in Russia by the example of his other novel, Taras Bulba. Taras Bulba is one of the most famous books about Cossack times. For years, this book was studied in schools and formed the image of Cossacks. What you are reading today and what your parents were reading in their times is an altered text. It differs significantly from the original. Look at the modern edition of the book. And I have the first edition here, first chapter. First chapter, I'm opening it. Bulba was very stubborn. He was quite a character, which could only emerge in the rough 15th century, when the just and unjust understanding of the land deformed. Wait, wait, here it is written, in the rough 15th century, in the semi-nomadic back corner of Europe, when primitive southern Russia was left by its... No, 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 no. It says, the domain where Ukraine belonged at the time. Hogel writes about Ukraine. Don't you have the phrase about primitive southern Russia? I don't. So Ukraine was changed into primitive Russia? Yes. We see alterations in the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th and 10th chapters. I found these changes myself. Let's open the last chapter, the episode of Bulba's farewell with his brothers in arms. Farewell, my dear brothers, fellows, he told them from above. Remember me sometimes. Don't forget to come back next summer and have a big feast here. Now read what you have. I have only have a big feast here, and then a whole new paragraph. Here goes, the time will come, and you will see what a true orthodox faith is. Hogel did not have this. He didn't. Wait. Bulba didn't say that. Its own Tsar will rise from the Russian land. He doesn't have this. And this, does such fire and power even exist to overcome the Russian strength? No. All this was added? Yes, there are no such words in the first edition. So they changed a few words in the beginning, and here we see the whole new paragraph. That is correct. Difficult to say how many new editions and how many copies the novel about Taras Bulba had after 1835, and it's even more challenging to realize how many people read this slightly altered text and understood Cossacks as a Russian force. Meanwhile, Gregor continues searching for the chest with the heart. He didn't find answers in Baturin and wants to see is there any documents proving the connection between Razumovsky and Khmelnytsky. He finds a seemingly insignificant research publication in family archives. It's mentioned that the year when Razumovsky became the president of the Academy of Sciences, Moscow archives received a request for originals of the Pereyaslav Treaty. 
It means that family legend is not a fantasy. Hetman was actively looking for the treaty, but did he find anything? We have new details. I didn't know that there was official requests for the search of the Pryaslav Treaty. It is astonishing. Moreover, Gregor finds the connection of Razumovsky to Khmelnytsky's maze. Before he became a hetman, Kirillo went abroad for his studies. He visited the best European universities and stayed in Warsaw. One of the theorists says that the mace was taken there as a trophy. I came to Poland. Many Ukrainian sources say that Khmelnytsky's mace is here. In the Museum of the Polish Army I meet with the historian Yaroslav Pych and art historian Wojciech Potrzebnitsky. Welcome. The artifact was in the repository of this huge museum, but they took it out to let us see it. Here is the maze from our collection, which interested you. May I take it? Sure, go on. But it is different from the maze depicted on the icons and paintings of Khmelnytsky. It looks modest, but it is made of a noble material. A rhino horn. Rhino horn? Yes. This material symbolizes power as the rhino itself. Holding this thing is incredible. 400 years ago, Bogdan Khmelnytsky held it in his hands. Khmelnytsky didn't hold it. It is not his mace. Are you saying that this mace has nothing to do with Bogdan Khmelnytsky? This mace is old, but it hardly belongs to his epoch. I am sure it is from the first half of the 18th century. But in Ukraine all historians believe that Khmelnytsky's mace is in Poland. I think they adapted our legendary version. Throughout the 19th century, since Romanticism, Poland had a tradition of attaching legends to different relics to show Polish people that they had the power attributes which once belonged to heroes. Remembering them gave hope for the resurrection of their great country. But Bogdan Khmelnytsky wasn't a Polish hero. Quite the contrary, he was an enemy of the Polish state. Yes, it was also crucial to Polish history. It showed that Poland could fight such a strong enemy. So we can discard the Polish theory. There are no facts to prove that Khmelnytsky's mace was ever here. I need to check another option for the potential location of the relic. Ukrainian lead takes us to Subotil, where Hetman lived and died. There is a theory that a maze could be in his grave. I found photos in the archive showing the excavations of the Khmelnytsky script. His tomb is in St. Elias church. Every Ukrainian has seen this church. It appears on a 5 hryvnia banknote. Information is scarce. Did they find the maze in the grave? What is the last passage that we see in the photos? Local historian Nadia Kuksa knows the answers. Nadia, hi. Hello. Thank you for meeting us. I wanted to show you a picture of Khmelnytsky's alleged burial place in this church. I am interested in this passage. What do you think about it? These are the pictures from the archaeological research, conducted from 1970 to 1973. Two holes were discovered in this part of the church. Two holes? Yes, probably breaches. Archaeologists said that someone dug in from the outside and stole the coffin with the body. It turns out Hetman's body disappeared from the church. But where to? It was one of the biggest mysteries in history. Nadia Kuksa tells about the most popular version. When Poles captured Subotim, they opened the tomb, took Khmelnytsky's ashes and fired them from the cannon. But no documentary evidence for this exists.
According to another hypothesis, Cossacks themselves reburied Hetman's body to hide it from enemies. Perhaps they buried him in one of the secret underground tunnels and hid his treasures with his body. People believe that someone hid a secret chest with the maze and other symbols of Hetman's power somewhere in the dungeons. The legend even mentioned the maze. Yes. So you don't rule out that his maze could be somewhere here? Yes, it could be somewhere in the vicinity. There are some sinkholes around the church. People thought there could be underground tunnels. Can we see it? Sure. Every subative inhabitant can tell a dozen legends about dungeons surrounding the church. But the truth is, no one ever found any of them. So the tunnel is under the cemetery. Possibly. Oops. Watch out. It's a steep slope. Yes, it's almost 30 meters. First clue I want to check is right next to the church, 100 meters to the east. Here's the sinkhole. It's just open like that? Yes. Can I go down? I don't recommend it. It's not safe. Why? A landslide might happen. You see, the land is moving even now. It's only five meters, and then the passage is blocked. The archaeologists could not get any further when they were here in 1954. We can't check this cave. It is blocked. But Nadia says there is another option. A sinkhole started to form in one of the houses near the church. Halina, are you home? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Ten years ago, something unusual happened in this yard. Now the uneven surface is the only reminder of the incident. Yes, a depression of about 10 centimeters. No more than 10. The owners laid gas pipes and dug a trench, but the soil suddenly fell into underground cavities. Soon a crater formed. Maybe 50 to 70 centimeters in diameter, a big hole, just a hole in the ground. What was the entrance? Just a hole. I see. Alina and her son decided to explore a mysterious pit, but a two-meter-long pole they used to measure the depth disappeared in the emptiness. That means that there is something underneath your yard. Maybe there is indeed a dungeon. Do you think this tunnel can connect your house with St. Elias Church? Why not? Halina's family has lived here for several centuries. According to family legend, Halina's ancestor was Himelnitsky's henchman, whose duty was to pay the wage to Cossacks. You know, I believe he was Hetman's trusted person. So, if, if there were some secret passages, they could possibly go through his house. You didn't have anything like that ever since. There is also a crack in the road. Over there? Yes. Show me this crack, please. I didn't notice it. Look, it's visible. It continues the line of the sinkhole in our yard. It seems we have the last piece of a puzzle. Yes, indeed, it goes into your yard. When you look at it separately, it might seem insignificant. But if we put it all together, we conclude that serious research is needed. If we look from the above, the crack is like a thread that connects Helena's yard and the church with Khmelnytsky's burial. Does it prove the existence of the secret tunnel? We need to find specific equipment to explore the territory and solve the mystery. This story began with the abduction of the hetman's heart. These pictures are shocking. It turned out that the most famous page of Ukrainian history, the Kozak epoch, was falsified and evidence deleted. So Ukraine was changed into primitive Russia. Yes. Together with a descendant of the last Ukrainian hetman, we started searching for the missing Kozak relics, which could bring our history back. The crown of Bogdan Khmelnytsky, 78 diamonds. 
What secrets does the flooded siege keep underwater? Let's see. With whom did the Turkish Sultan correspond 40 years ago? We'll translate a letter that scholars have been trying to decipher for decades. The word Kozak is clearly visible. Kozak? What was in the faithful treaty between Ukraine and Russia? Is the unification of two peoples just fiction? Could this be true? Now we will find out. Is there an underground tunnel in Subotyum with the treasures of Bogdan Khmelnytsky? Hi. Good afternoon. Come on in. In the Central Historical Archive, Gregor meets Olha Vok. She's a researcher in the old depositories. She found some crucial documents about the connection between two hetmans. In 1758, the National Code of Arms design was approved. Kirill Rozumovsky wanted to use it on the state seals. The design included a Cossack with a gun and a saber. Fascinating. It has the word national. Yes, National Code of Arms. We now used to say Ukrainian people, Ukrainian nation. Kirill Rozumovsky is the first to use nation regarding Ukrainians. This is the authentic proscript of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. There is a similar image on his seal. They are slightly different, but generally the same. A Kazakh, a gun, a saber, and an inscription in a circle. This is very interesting. The symbols are identical. This shows that Razumovsky associated himself with Khmelnytsky and his ideas. Bogdan Khmelnytsky was a revolutionary. He did everything to unite Cossacks from different territories into a single force and then into a state. Razumovsky was trying to do the same at his own risk. As soon as he was elected hetman, he addressed the Cossacks and promised to revive the power of the Cossack state. He gave the lands for free to others. The Russian empress forbade it. So he began to buy land officially and give plots to Cossacks. An important step in developing the Cossack aristocracy. I think it was an effective tactic to unite the country, which was really needed at the time. Even their personalities match. In the diaries of his contemporaries, Bogdan is also described as attentive to all regardless of status. An Orthodox, Patriarch Makari, who was visiting Hetman, even gave him a bag of coffee beans. It was a ghostly present at the time. The Patriarch was very impressed with Hetman's kind nature. A parallel between the two Hetmans, Bogdan Hmelnitsky and Kirill Razumovsky, is undeniable. They both were trying to create a state. In Subotiv, I'm trying to check the legend about Khmelnytsky's mace hidden in the dungeons. We involved Ruslan Khomenko, an expert from the Institute of Geophysics of the National Shevchenko University. Ruslan, hi. Hello. Let me show you the place of search. Legends say there are many underground tunnels here. I told Ruslan all the stories I heard from the locals, so he could make his own opinion. If we get the facts together, things we've seen in the yard, the legends, this could be interesting. What do you think? The crack crosses the road perpendicularly. It is curious. It could be a tunnel. We need to establish that. Scientist from Kyiv will use the newest technology for his research – electrotomograph. 
It looks like a pile of wires and electrodes. But electrotomograph principle is based on a scientific breakthrough acknowledged with the Nobel Prize. To begin with, we'll mark the territory. We'll put electrodes a meter from one another. Electrodes will conduct the electric current up to 10 meters underground. They will, so to say, cut into the earth like a hot knife in the butter. Then the computer will receive and process the information passed through the wires. Now we're connected. Let's start. We're on. Every dot shows a separate electrode and its signal. If there is something there, we will see that, absolutely. In an hour, our expert finishes analyzing the data. He is ready to share his conclusions with us. What can you say about these results? You can see the crack here. In this part, there's an anomaly, and there's a high possibility that it is a tunnel. A tunnel, yes. You want to say that this spot might be a tunnel. It is a no tunnel. It is partly filled with water. This is just fantastic. It is not a legend. Yes, no, it is not a legend. For several centuries, scientists, scholars and treasure hunters tried to find the legendary dungeons of Subotiva. It is an unprecedented discovery. Can we find the entrance to this tunnel? We see in the data that if there is a tunnel, it is partly flooded or blocked with landslides. So we probably cannot go through. Hardly. Can we see anything in the tunnel based on this data? Let's say boxes or even a coffin. Unfortunately, now we don't have methods that allow us to find objects underground. It is pretty deep, even for a metal detector. Passage is blocked. At this point we cannot check if there is any Hetman treasures underground. Professional archaeologists should step in and conduct a full-scale excavation. We will review other clues. Ruslan was so shocked by the falsification of Hohol's texts that he decided to find out more. What did Hohol know about Cossack history? In Poltava region we found a historian Oleksii Sokirko, who did his research. He appointed a meeting in the former estate of Danilo Apostol, one of the Cossack leaders. Oleksii, hi, good afternoon. Recently Oleksii found some secret documents in one of the archives. They prove that Cossack history wasn't as we learn it. What do you mean? I have direct evidence of this, but I'll tell you more when we come closer. Let's go. Again, it is about the Periaslav Treaty. According to the copy, Russia got the right to place its military garnisons in Ukraine. Their number constantly grew. It was more of an occupation than the unification of two brotherly nations. Russian politics towards Ukraine may have been changing, but one trend was persistent under any circumstances – strengthening the direct military presence in Ukraine. Military presence limited Cossacks' rights. They started to resist. This decrepit estate of the ancient Cossack family of Apostles was one of the centers of resistance. In 1723, most Cossack leadership ended up incarcerated in Petersburg after the protests. An order arrived to make an inventory of Apostles' property and send it to Petersburg. So people who arrested Apostol registered every item on this estate. Yes, we know what was here because of this description. 
This document is a bridge to the times when the walls were not yet in rubbles, windows weren't broken, life was blooming here, and everything was full of beauty and comfort. This document shows us the life of this estate and its inhabitants. Is this the inventory made during the arrest of Danilo Apostol? Yes, it is. The furniture, kilims, tableware, paintings, everything was put into boxes. The boxes were numbered and marked with the price and weight. What was the sum if we added up all the boxes? The total value if we take all the jewelry, money and precious metals amounts to half tone of gold and silver. Half tone of gold and silver in household items only? Yes. All this wasn't stored in a cottage with an earthen floor and thatched roof. It was a developed, civilized nation, the memory of which remains only in the moldy papers. Wait, if they were eating on golden and silver plates, it was hardly rough food. Absolutely. We have the list of food and stocks stored in the local kitchen in this inventory. Foreign wines, French, Hungarian, German, French and Italian cheeses such as Parmesan, Asparagus, Parmesan and asparagus, Cossacks ate all these delicacies. Cossacks elite loved fine cuisine. They knew all the fashionable European trends, imported food and drinks and also toiletries. Let's see the list of dresses. There are separate selections for men's, women's and even children's clothing. Russians who arrested Apostol didn't even know the names for the most things. All the clothing items go under one line – dresses. But in a Cossack's costume every item had its name. Some clothing items, such as Robron, are not Ukrainian, but French. It was a lady's dress with lacing. In Chernihiv Historical Museum there is a miraculously saved overcoat that once belonged to Daniela Apostol's daughter. It is made of brocade used for the royal dresses in Europe. This fabric was more valuable than jewels. It shows that these fashion trends were quite popular here. The Soviets turned the estate of this old family into a pig breeding college. Under its signboard, they buried not only the history of the wealth and lifestyle of apostles, but something much more important. The symbols of power were also kept here. In Danilo Apostol's property inventory, we see a gilded pernach. What is this? It is a type of a colonel's mace. As a rule, every Cossack colonel would have several maces decorated with jewels and inlays. They kept them in special encasements, with secret locks, impossible to open without a key. So in such estates there were also symbols of the power of the Cossack elite. Yes, of course, these politicians spent most of their lives in these places. It is not a coincidence that the symbols of power were taken. It was a targeted campaign to destroy the evidence of the functioning state and government formed by the Cossack elite. We knew more about persons such as Kachubey, who betrayed Mazepa with the Russians. But we wouldn't know much about other people from Mazepa's circle. We didn't even remember all the hetmans, because they weren't important. We were allowed to know only a tiny part of our history. Almost everywhere the history of the Cossack aristocracy was erased from memory. The palaces were dismantled for bricks, as if they never existed. But this photo is a rare proof that this history is real. In the picture we see Vasil Tarnovsky, the descendant of the Cossack family, in his palace where he collected Cossack memorabilia. A mace is in the center. I came to his residence in Kachanivka. Historian Taras Shevchenko meets me here. Hi, Taras. Good afternoon.
The resident's owner was obsessed with Kozak history. Neighbor landowners wrote in their memoirs that they'd come to visit Tarnovsky. Their servants were wearing Kozak costumes of the 17th, 18th centuries. The most tried to recreate the spirit of Kozak times, the times of Bogdan Khmelnytsky, exactly. He was trying to revive this history. And this is the main building, exactly. In Soviet times there was an orphanage, and a hospital, and later a tuberculosis dispensary. With Apostol's estate, the building's new function was to hide the history of treasures once kept here. The collection had thousands of exhibits. Thousands, yes. Every room was another exhibition. So the place reminded a museum where people lived. Nothing left of the collection of the Kozak relics. But Taras says they have a catalogue with a mace of the list. A hetman mace, large, silver, gilded. The ball is smooth, covered with an embossed pattern inlaid with turquoise. 78 diamonds? Well, yes. Could this mace belong to Bogdan Khmelnytsky? Sure, such a mace, big, valuable, with so many jewels, could only belong to some outstanding person in Ukrainian history during the Kozak period. As far as I understand, you don't have these exhibits in Kachanivka. At the end of his life, Vasil Tarnovsky Jr. bequeathed his collection to the city of Chernihiv. You have to look there. Information we've got in Kachanivka at last moved our investigation from a standstill. More than 100 years ago, when the collection arrived at Chernihiv, the city created a separate museum for it. We found out that the mace is being kept in a special vault. Here I meet with the collection custodian Anna Arendar. Anna Petrivna, good afternoon. Greetings. Please, come in and put on your gloves. So, this is where Tarnovsky collection is? Yes. In this vault we keep some of our treasures. Many of them are on display. Wow. Yes, come in. Here it is. A special chest for the most valuable relic. A mace of the great hetman. In a moment we will see it. This chest is like a safe box with several locks and secret mechanisms. This is Hetman's mace, a Cossack emblem of power. But it is sewn apart, and the main part is missing. This is a very old story that happened Almost a hundred years ago, on May 17, 1919, the Museum of Ukrainian Antiques of Vasil Tarnovsky here in Chernihiv was robbed. The robbers broke three showcases with Kazakh symbols of power, hetman's maces, bernakes of Kazakh colonels. They stole 60 items. Robbers sawed the mace in two parts because it didn't fit the back. They tore off the valuable velvet and took out the stones. You can see how they took them off. After two weeks, only some of the broken valuables were recovered. All this happened right after Bolsheviks established their authorities in the city. They wanted to steal these particular objects, the symbols of Hetman's power. This mace is made in the Ukrainian Baroque style. In the 1750s, 1780s. 18th century. Yes. So this mace didn't belong to Bogdan Khmelnytsky? No. Would the robbers steal it if they knew it wasn't Khmelnytsky's mace? The events which happened here a century ago are similar to the opening of the crypt of Kirill Razumovsky. The same year and the stolen objects were connected to Hetman's in both cases. Was it the hunt after the symbols of Hetman's power? 
many elements of Ukrainian history, documents, artifacts. Where did they go? How could they disappear? It was systematic. The chest with the heart was sent to Konatop, and it disappeared. It is the biggest mystery. All information in Gregor's investigation fits into the following picture. Hetman Razumovsky was looking for Khmelnytsky's maze. He united influential Cossacks and organized the search for the Pryaslav Treaty. It seems he was preparing for something important. But someone erased this information like a file from a computer. We worked hard to establish at least some facts. Among the hundreds of old manuscripts, Gregor found information that puts everything in its place. This is the letter from the Moscow archive to Kirill Rizumovsky regarding Periaslav Treaty. Here's the answer. Bogdan Khmelnytsky wrote to the old chancellery, we are looking throughoutly, did they find them? They didn't find them, not even in the old depositories. Is this true? I don't believe in this. This document is way too important. There are no originals. The original treaty was not found. They had copies or duplicates written in the Moscow bureaucratic language of the 17th century. We don't have copies of the Ukrainian side of the treaty. If we had an original treaty, we could read it and tell if it was a unification of Ukraine and Russia or just an alliance agreement. This information would change the course of history. When Kirill Razumovsky realized that there was no authentic document about a union between Russia and Ukraine, he had his hands untied. It meant there were no obligations to Russia. He goes to Petersburg to see the Empress. But as soon as he raised the question of independence, he was instantly arrested and forced to give up the hetman's mace. What would happen if he didn't resign? He would be executed. She could easily do that. Razumovsky was banned from Ukraine. His contacts with Cossacks were limited, so that he wouldn't raise an uprising. In fact, some people followed him, his actions, and informed the government. If he did something against Empress' will, he would be killed. Having isolated Hetman, Catherine II liquidated Cossack state and after that destroyed Zaporizhka siege, which existed as a separate military entity. I came to Dnipro Rapids, which marked the borders of the siege territory. The fortification stood on almost every island, but these days nothing reminds of it. The Russian army destroyed the settlements one by one. Resistance to the military, with a huge advantage in numbers, was futile. On the last siege, Russians found a stash with some things that might explain Cossacks' plans. They put guards everywhere, then rummaged the church and found a treasure under the altar. It was not maces or sabers, but valuable documents. These documents contained letters between Kirill Rozumovsky and Zaporizhia Cossacks. He tried to unite all parts of Ukraine in one struggle, as Bogdan Khmelnytsky once did. That is why the last hetman needed his mace. Khmelnytsky was a state founder. And if Rozumovsky could find his symbol of power, he could implement grand plans. The ruling seat goes with the mace. In Zaporizhia I'm trying to check the theory about the mace on the last Cossack siege. 
This military settlement existed long after the arrest of Kirill Razumovsky. There is a story that there were several hideouts on the island, and the Russians didn't find all of them. But there is a problem. In Soviet times, these territories were flooded for the reservoir. We will try to get to the Cossack stashes. Dmitro Kobalya, an underwater archaeologist of the Hortica National Reserve, will help us. Dima, hi. Hello. I am interested in the last destroyed siege, the so-called New Siege. There is a theory that before Catherine II ruined the siege, Cossacks brought their most valuable belongings there – old maces, flags and even important documents. It could have happened, because all the valuables were kept on siege. Eight years ago we did an archaeological exploration. We found many objects right on the surface. We didn't even have to dig them. I found a smoking pipe. It felt like we were on the same territory 250 years ago. Look, if we take a map from 1842, we'll see that the now flooded territory belonged to the Great Meadow. The siege was here, on this spot, yes, here. Let's look at the later maps. For instance, the German military map. They even marked the place of the siege. We can put this World War II map on the modern map and see where it was. This plot is not too big, but still it's 150 meters long to 150 meters wide. Aerial survey is the only way to narrow down the search. The flight in a hot air balloon will define the coordinates and the center of siege. According to the archaeologists, the intersection church was where the secret stash was. The siege was there. The leadership was living around the perimeter. There was gunpowder storage and military chancellery. Over there, approximately in the center, stood intercession church, where Cossacks went to pray before setting off to a campaign. Was that the main structure on the siege? Of course, Cossacks met there to elect their leaders. The little-known fact is that there was a Russian military garrison next to siege. Russians were always afraid that the Cossacks were unpredictable. They had self-rule and democracy, and they elected their leaders. So they were under Russian surveillance. They were mostly monitored. But today the earthen fortifications of the Russian garrison can help us to localize siege underwater. It means we have more chances to find something there. I think so. Most of the facts about Cossacks were erased from our history. Even the most famous siege of Hortice is only a replica built in 2004 as a general reconstruction of the Cossack everyday life. A wooden huts, half-literate men in colored sharovars, white trousers. This is the Cossack history we know. But foreigners visiting Ukraine in the 17th century saw and described different people. Sergei Shemenkov, reenactor, researched the notes of the French engineer Guillaume de Beauplan. He will tell Ruslan about his revelations. Hi. Beauplan describes people living in the region and writes about Cossacks. He leaves notes about their appearance. What does it mean? Bonnet is a hat. The rope is a kind of a coat. And he mentions calaisons. The word still in use, meaning narrow pants. I see. In the Soviet time translation we read, Cossacks were a shirt and sharavars, a coat and a hat. 
Colossons are narrow pants, and Bob Lane doesn't mention neither white pants nor the word Sharuvari. So Sharuvars is another myth. We have a unique opportunity to see the real Cossack look in Khmelnytsky times. You're kidding. It looks modern. Yes, very much like modern fashion. Very interesting. Also, nobody wore shirts like this. They covered shirts with an overcoat. Cossack everyday look had many elements, and each had its purpose. There were different types of overcoats. We need boots. It's the type Cossacks wore. Is this leather? Yes, it is. 400 years ago, ordinary Cossacks wore leather boots. Interesting. I've never thought Cossacks looked like this. Where did Sharovars come from? And why the history of the Cossack costume was so simplified? The fact is, Sherovars did exist, but much later, in the 18th century, when the Russian Empire finally integrated Ukrainian lands. This is more of a Cossack I know about, because it is an established image of a brotherly nation, which serves the Empire and is not associated with the rebellious Cossacks of Bogdan Khmelnytsky, Sahidachny, Vyhovsky. Soviet historiography erased these images, as well as their actual appearance. We look for the remnants of the intersection church underwater on Kahovka Reservoir. Massive number of heritage objects were flooded, thousands of objects. If we drain the water in Kahovka and Dnipro Reservoirs, we'll have to rewrite archaeological history completely. There will be many new finds which will change our understanding of the past. To get to the underwater Cossack treasures, and perhaps Khmelnytsky's maze, we selected a team of professionals – divers, underwater archaeologists and georadar experts. We'll mark a quadrant and we'll work within. The water isn't deep, and the water is strong, so the waves are high. It complicates the search. A third one? We use super technologies, but the search zone is too big. It's looking for a needle in a haystack. We see the depth of 7 meters. The bottom is flat, with no serious anomalies. But after a few dozen meters, the bottom relief starts changing. We have some anomaly. Do you see the dots? Some objects have right angles. It is not a natural form as we know. It could be a building. We should use georadars now. We explore the zone with a special underwater georadar. It scans the bottom and can penetrate even deeper under the layer of silt. Here's this object half a meter high. It is not homogeneous. It consists of layers. I think it is artificial. I think this is what we need. We have to look underwater. We decide to dive. But the weather is unfavorable, and we have almost zero underwater visibility, so it's pretty dangerous. Let's go. Let's see what we have there. Seven meters underwater, total darkness. We have to work by touch. Every moment the ruins of the church foundation can appear, with Cossack treasures buried underneath. They managed to rescue one chest before Russian invasion. It is Tarateka, an icon with a cross instead of a painting. Today it is on display in the Nikopol local lore museum.
It is possible that the rest of the treasures and Khmelnytsky maze is still underwater. Dmitro inspects the bottom with a special metal detector. I'm trying to find at least some church foundations. In the spot detected by Georadar, we see a wooden object, which looks like a pillar. Another one is five meters away. What is it? Parts of the building or something else? Sometimes we see the items which prove that people once lived here. Meter by meter we explore the quadrant we've marked, but we can't find what we are looking for, the church foundation. Is this a piece of ceramics? Let me see. What do you think? Most probably it's ceramics from Pokrovska village. It is more recent. This one looks older, maybe even from siege. But I didn't notice anything we saw on Georadar. No buildings, trees are cut. Probably Russian completely cleared the territory and found the stash. Maybe yes, maybe no. But we haven't found the stash here. We need to search somewhere else. Stalin personally decided to create Kachovka Reservoir. He finished what the Russian Empress Catherine II began 200 years before. A secret Empress order shows how furious she was when she found out about the agreement between Razumovsky and Cossacks. She wanted to wipe their history off the face of the earth. When little Russia won't have Hetman, we need to put all the effort so that the very name of Hetman is gone forever. So the idea of Novorossiya emerged. Archaeologist Igor Sapozhnikov waits for Ruslan in Bilhorodnistrovsky. He says that Novorossiya is not just a geographical name, but a cunning plan, which was implemented. And we didn't even notice it. This is why we meet here, on the walls of Ackerman Fortress. This fortress belonged to the Osman Empire and adjacent lands to the Crimean Khanate. The population here consisted of Tatars, Turks and Ukrainians. They all have a different history. And then Russia came and called all this Novorossiya. That political concept is still alive. Bilhrodnistrovsky, Ovidiopol, Chornomorsk, hundreds of other cities and towns in the south of Ukraine and even Odessa had different names and histories. It was all erased by the order from Petersburg. We changed the name and we get new history. This is what they wanted to do. It is particularly obvious in the Odessa example. Its history officially started in 1794, but we know for sure that Cossacks lived here before that. The settlement named Kochubey was here back in 1415, and it is mentioned in the written sources. There is the official history of the cities, including Odessa. Now its main symbol is Potemkin stairs. There is nothing about Cossacks. Something is left, not only here on the estuary shores, but closer to Odessa too. On a Cossack boat, Ruslan and Igor Sapozhnikov go to the other side of the estuary. Archaeologist says that for a long time the evidence of Catherine's sly plans to change the Cossack lands into Novorossiya was in plain view for everyone to see, but nobody even suspected it. Only recently scholars deciphered information that changed everything. I wouldn't call it a cultural shock, but it has considerably changed our views on history. We were pretty narrow-minded. Here you go. Wow! There are no names or other information about the deceased on these crosses. But the crosses themselves tell more than any words. These are Cossacks' crosses. 
This is your evidence that Cossacks were here much earlier than Russians, correct. When we began to look at where are they from, their typology, when we've studied siege crosses, we realized they belonged to Cossacks or their descendants. The typology of these crosses is very diverse. There are places where you have memorials, but you don't have memory. And here we have everything, well said, there is everything. Imagine, these crosses are all over the south of Ukraine. Just pay attention when you drive to the seaside, look along the highway, in the middle of the fields. But Cossack history was so thoroughly hidden that scholars only recently realized whose are those crosses. Our search for Khmelnytsky's maze goes on to Podilia. We checked all the theories related to Hetman himself. They were non-effective. Perhaps the relic was passed on to the heir, his younger son Yuri. One of the legends says that his path finished in Kamenets Podilsky, where he was executed. Hetman's son was hanged on a rope from the bridge. Are there any documents about these events? Can we find at least some mentions about lost maze? This man promised to help with our investigation. Oleksandr Zaremba is a head of the Kamenets Podilsky Museum. Hi, good day. Historian says there is no evidence of Yuri's execution in Kamenets. But there is a fascinating document in their archives from this period a letter from a Turkish Sultan. 400 years we were told an altered history of Cossacks. The truth was different. Neither white pants nor the word Sharovari are mentioned here. We were allowed to know only a tiny part of our history. The hetman symbols of power that proved their independence were stolen from Ukraine and hidden in a secret place. We will follow the trace of a large-scale campaign of valuables extraction. Here you have the seal of the same archive. Where are 60 tons of Ukrainian relics today? This information is classified. What secrets of Ukrainian treasures were discovered by the American scholars? Khmelnytsky who will give us the last clue to return the nation's treasures. Secret department, archive documents, classified and top secret. Our search for Khmelnytsky's maze goes on to Podilia. We checked all the theories related to Hetman himself. They were non-effective. Perhaps the relic was passed on to the heir, his younger son Yuri. One of the legends says that his path finished in Kamenets Podilsky, where he was executed. Hetman's son was hanged on a rope from the bridge. Are there any documents about those events? Can we find at least some mentions about the lost maze? This man promised to help with our investigation. Oleksandr Zaremba is a head of the Kamenets Podilsky Museum. Hi, good day. Historian says there is no evidence of Yuri's execution in Kamenets. But there is a fascinating document in their archives from this period. A letter from a Turkish Sultan. Wow! This is one of the unique exhibits in our museum. As far as I'm aware, there are no similar objects in Ukraine. It looks grand. Look at the size of it, over a meter long and almost a meter wide. This is Osman Empire, a superpower, which showed their status in the world. Even with their letters. Fantastic. We can date it more or less accurately. It is the period of Mehmed IV. We see that by the sign on the top. I see. This is his official signature. A lot of information is coded there, including his titles, name and so on. It's incredible, yes.
The signature is golden. It is real gold. In those times, Osman Empire was a global superpower, very strong. Its influence in the world was probably greater than today's US. This document is very well preserved, although it's 300 years old. It's almost intact. What's hidden in these characters, in these words? Here is the most exciting part. Language and writing in the 19th century in the Osman Empire significantly changed. Nowadays, literally few people in the world can read this. Unfortunately, we don't know what it is about. Are you saying you don't know what's there? Yes, this is our museum riddle. Local historians for years have been puzzled by the contents of this letter. A few times they have sent the photos of the ancient manuscript to Turkologists, but no one was able to read this encrypted Ottoman calligraphy. Do you know at least to whom they sent this letter? We can't say until we read it. I think only Turkish specialists could help here. I contacted a historian, Oleksandr Sereda. He is a Ukrainian working in Turkey for a long time. He is one of the few scholars in the world who know the old Osmanic language. He was very interested in the document and wanted to try and decode it. His interest was ignited by the author's persona, Sultan Mehmed IV. He was one of the most outstanding rulers of the Osman Empire. His rule started when Bogdan Khmelnytsky was elected hetman. Mehmed IV and Ukraine have another connection – his mother's blood. Khatice Sultan Turkan was Ukrainian from Podilla. Her Christian name was Nadia. We don't know the last name. She had a great influence on her son. She also always stressed that he had Cossack origin. Is there another connection between Khmelnytsky and Mehmed IV? Maybe this letter will reveal the facts we don't know. Searching for his ancestor's heart, Gregor ended up at the dead end. No mentions of the relic after the crypt was opened in 1922. He decided to check information about all known burials of Hetmans and Cossack elites. He discovered some unexpected facts. At the time of the opening of the Razumovsky crypt, there were other tomb openings in Ukraine. would not have been realistic to expect it wasn't realistic to expect to find coins or gold there. People who opened crypts knew this. The documents about the opening of the Kozak Lizahoop family crypt even mention the names of the involved Bolsheviks. Gregor sets off to the town of Sedniv in Chernihiv region, where these sinister events took place. Local historian Erwin Midden meets him here. Lizahoop family was one of the wealthiest Cossack families at the time. This family helped Gregor's ancestor to become a hetman. Their influence and fortune were legendary. You see Lizahoop's family crypt in the Resurrection Church. Lizahoop was a general convoy lead, or we can say a prime minister of the Cossack state. I know about this family. They were great patriots of Ukraine and put a lot of effort into the restoration of hetmanship in Ukraine. You're correct. No one knew about the crypt for a long time. The entrance to the dungeon was under the floor. We're in one of the crypts in the family tomb of Lizahoop's. 44 bodies were resting in here. Now there's only one body left. When Bolsheviks came, they used church as a vegetable storage. Maybe they would never know about the crypt, but one of the activists saw mysterious holes in the foundation of the church. That's how communists discovered a hidden place. 
It all happened in 1924. They took the bodies away. Only one mummy came back. You can see it here. Only one person in the big family which existed for over three centuries. Now we cannot even credibly say whose body this is. Where are other bodies? Unfortunately, most mummies were taken away for anti-religious exhibitions. Here's the explanation. Bolsheviks used dead bodies for their ideological fight with the church. They exhibited the undressed relics of the landowner Lisa Hoop. Oh my God! This is how they tried to prove that there is no miracle in mummification. As you know, I'm looking for things from my ancestor's grave, mainly a metal box with embalmed heart. Where did this mummy come from? It was in an anti-religious camp of the Kyiv Pechersk Lavra. Was it? The mummy was kept there. Maybe Razumovsky's heart was there too. It's an important clue, and we'll check Kyiv Pechersk Lavra. I am in Istanbul with a copy of the letter of Sultan Mehmed IV. It is unique evidence of the events happening 400 years ago. Such documents are scarce in Ukraine, which was robbed of most of its historical artifacts. We are fortunate, and we will know soon what's hidden in the old letter. Oleksandr Sereda is waiting for me. Oleksandr, hi. hi. Historian works at the Ukrainian Studies Department in the oldest Turkish university. Here you have some of the oldest archives in Istanbul and Turkey. The real house of knowledge. Yes, indeed. Here historians have access to many rare documents. But this rarity is one of a kind. Can you understand what is written here? Let's start. I can see Mim, he, Mehmed bin Ibrahim. It means Mehmed, Ibrahim's son. So this is Mehmed the fourth indeed, yes. What about the text itself? Can you read it? It is not easily legible, but we'll try. In the first line, it should be a name. He addresses one of the most prominent rulers of the Christian peoples. I see. He writes to the Christian ruler. Here I can clearly see the word Kozak. Kozak? Yes, yes. Kozak Hetman. He mentions Kozak Hetman. Yes. Here is the name which starts with B. Bogdan. 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 Khmelnitsky. This is incredible. This letter was addressed to Bogdan Khmelnitsky. Yes, this is definitive. Sultan's letter may contain information that will lead us to the trail of the mace. It is very intriguing. The mystery of the letter grows. This text needs closer research. Can you translate it? Let me try. Translating the letter, Oleksandr Serada established the date of its writing, 1651, on the eve of the Brestechko battle. Official history says that the battle was lost to Poland because Kozak Ali, Crimean Han and his troops had left the battlefield at the last moment. There was no evidence of that, but the theory fit the Soviet ideology that showed Crimean Tatars as traitors and enemies of Ukrainian people. This stereotype was imposed for years, centuries.
Islam Gerehan was supposed to help in the battle against Poland. Sultan personally asked Crimean Han. It is unlikely that Islam Gerey would disobey the superior ruler and leave Khmelnytsky near Berestechko. The documents, such as this letter, show us a new history. But there is something at the end of the letter. Oleksandr Sarada thinks it is overwhelming. Mehmed IV sees Bogdan Khmelnytsky as a very close friend. He sent him a present that was too expensive, even for many European rulers. Is this possibly a mace? Sultan sends a gold-woven rope. A rope? Yes. It is the sign of the closest friendship. Sultan sends a rope to Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Yes. He asks to accept this present with all due respect and wear it. It was a top present in the Osman Empire at the time. Translation doesn't provide any clues for our search, but it is crucial for historians because it offers a new look at the events of the past. In Istanbul we rediscover erased files of our history. Another meeting confirms that Sultan's letter is only the beginning of the sensational discoveries. Oleksandra Shutko is an Orientalist scholar. She does her research in Turkey. In one of the Kyiv archives she found a photo of the unusual Oriental adornment. She thinks this is a hetman's crown. This thing belonged to Bogdan Khmelnytsky? I think so. Indeed, in all the images he is depicted with some sort of a feather in his hat. Yes, and this is the adornment under this feather. Osman Sultans attached such precious decorations to their turbans. It was their symbol of power, like the crown of European monarchs. It is fascinating that a similar thing also belonged to Hetman. The crown of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. It is amazing. It turns out that Cossack leaders were crowned, but these crowns were in the Oriental style. This is why the information in the historical sources is absent. It's pure gold. Gold? Yes. There is also a ruby. I think these are pearls. Yes, pearls and diamond inlays. It is very precious, and I've never seen the original. Where is it now? I can assume not in Ukraine. The negative is from the beginning of the last century. So the national treasures were preserved until modern times, and we have a chance to find them. With a clue, Gregor comes to Kyiv Pechersk Lavra in the search for the heart. After the revolution, Bolsheviks turned the oldest cave monastery into a museum quarter. The descendant of the last hetman addressed his request to Irina Martinyuk, head custodian of the Lavra collection. Many documents were lost during World War II. We are now trying to research and find any information about the lost collections. The only old document here is this one album. It contains photos of the items brought to this museum quarter in the 1920s. Crosses, valuable priest headdresses, communion goblets, hundreds of other valuable items. Museum experts say that most of them were Cossack donations to the church. These things form a national identity, the sense of aesthetic beauty. But the most important thing for the nation is the memory of the people who own this. This album looks like the part of the more extensive catalogue, but there are no other volumes. It doesn't look like scholars made it. 
They usually do very detailed descriptions. While here, we can see only inventory notes, no provenance and no storage location. In this volume, Gregor didn't find the mentions of the box with the heart, but he finds the photo of the hetman's feather. So Khmelnytsky's crown was in Pechersk Lavra. But it is no longer here, as well as the box with Razumovsky's heart. Who took the artifacts and where? You can't explain everything with World War II losses. In the catalogue notes, there is a mention of a commission of the extraction of the church property. To find out about this half-secret organization, Ruslan meets the doctor of history Oleksiy Nestulia, who investigates commission activities. Good afternoon. Hi. You research this period. Can you explain what that commission was? Yes. It's 1922. Hunger and devastation after the war. Under the pretext of fighting against hunger, the USSR decides to cast a decisive blow to the church. They started confiscating church property and creating special commissions for this purpose. Commissions consisted of NKVS officers and militia. Bolsheviks confiscate valuables from the churches, museums, wealthy estates and even from ordinary people. All this they loaded into guarded trains. If it was a secret service operation, how do we find out where they took all this? Czechists were hiding their traces very well. But some relevant documents show the scale of confiscations and main destinations. Only thanks to the railway bureaucracy, Oleksiy Nestulia could get closer to the truth. These are consignment notes issued by the railway to book the trains for cargo transportation. A cargo of utmost importance. Yes, that's right. The dates and geography of confiscation campaign coincided with the details in these consignment notes. In those times, chaos reigned over the railway, and here we see a few dozens of trains that secretly travel all over Ukraine, from Kyiv, Mykolaiv, Kremenchuk, Odessa, Dnipro, Chernihiv, Zhitomir, Poltava, Vinnytsia, Bakhmut, and even Simferopol, to the Soviet capital in Kharkiv. The reins are guarded and accumulated in Kharkiv. They create the illusion that these valuables will be used to save millions of people. Why do you say illusion? Because it wasn't the final destination for these valuables. We have documents about relocating these valuables from Kharkiv to Moscow. Look, there are so many of them. There are dozens. This information is top secret. This is a new turn in our investigation. What has happened to all these things in Moscow? There was one Ukrainian who could get there following the confiscated valuables. It was Danilo Sherbakivsky. We started searching for this person and found his notes in the archive of the Archaeology Institute. Ruslan meets here with a historian Irina Hodak. She prepared the documents. This is the main folder about his work in Moscow. 
Danilo Sherbakivsky was a Ukrainian museum professional. He was trying to single-handedly resist the Bolsheviks, who confiscated the valuables from the museums, churches and crypts. Despite the crazy obstacles, after tedious negotiations on the highest level, he went to Moscow and got into a secret vault. I suggest you look at one very interesting document with a seal of this depository. State Depository. Yes. In short, this institution called Gohran. In this vault, Danilo Sherbakivsky identified 60 tones of the stolen Ukrainian relics. He was able to return some of them. Just above 3%, 3.3%. 3 3%, and 97 left there. Moreover, many items were broken or destroyed. But there are documents showing that Hetman items were vandalized in Kochran. The head of the Moscow repository ordered to break one of the most significant Ukrainian relics, a 17th-century cross. Bogdan Hmelnitsky presented this cross to Kiev Pichers Glavra. He saw many things there that belonged to Mazepa, Razumovsky. Sherbakivsky planned to return the nation's treasures, but he wasn't allowed to finish his work in Moscow. In 1927, on the evening of June 6, this man, who was not afraid of anyone or anything, went to the Dnipro River, tied a stone to his neck and committed suicide. This is a convenient coincidence. He was the only historian who got into the secret vault. I am very sorry to say it is so. The relics Sherbakivsky returned to Ukraine are still a minuscule but very valuable part of history that was erased. Ruslan discovered that Gohran still exists. We sent an inquiry to Moscow and asked for the mace and the crown of Khmelnytsky and the box with the heart of Razumovsky. The mentioned valuables are not present. Information about Gohran activities in the last century is still classified. All the documents are top secret. There is only one person in the world who got close to the secrets of this organization. He lives in the US. I came to Bard College, where historian Sean McMeekin works. He finished a real investigation and might know something about what we are looking for. Gohran was selling national treasures from all over the Soviet Union abroad. But Sean McMicken found out that they spent only a minimal amount to mitigate the hunger issue. People were dying without food. The money was spent on strengthening the totalitarian regime. Sean McMicken traced the name of the Swiss banker who helped the Bolsheviks to sell the valuables they plundered abroad. I call him Bolsheviks banker. Gohran was transferring precious metals and stones to him, pearls, diamonds. There are approximate figures of what he sold. I estimated that he sold valuables at the beginning of 1920s, amounting to 20 million dollars. In today's money it is 20 billion. This is an enormous sum, but in fact Bolsheviks were selling national relics by weight. They didn't even think about their intangible value. But the buyers knew the actual price. 
Whoever is owner now, they keep it in secret. If someone tries to sell the maize today, they will do this quietly. During your investigation, have you ever come across these items? Hetman's jeweled feather and mace. Khmelnytsky. I haven't seen those items, and unfortunately, I don't have any related information. Try checking private collections where they have items of Russian or Ukrainian origin. You'll find the information in the New York Public Library. Thank you. New York Public Library is one of the biggest in the world. We need someone to help us not to drown in the ocean of information. So we found Lyudmila Shpilova, a librarian specializing in the collections of the books written in Cyrillic. I have access to unique sources. A few years ago I found an article in one of the rare magazines. I think you might find this article interesting. It mentions the mace and Khmelnytsky. Will the American trace lead us to the Ukrainian treasures? Lyudmila Shpilova says that the maize got to the U.S. not from Gokhran, but from Kuban Cossacks, who were fleeing Soviets across the ocean. They kept all relics from siege and brought them to the U.S. Our informer is ready to show the evidence. This is the magazine Free Kuban I told you about. It has this mention. And a photo. This mace was a symbol of the power of siege leaders. Its origins are lost in the past. Perhaps Bogdan Khmelnytsky held it in his hands. You know, it's an incredible find. We've never before found documentary evidence that Khmelnytsky mace existed. Only saw it in the paintings and icons. Where is this mace now? Perhaps it is in the Kuban Military Museum, here, in New Jersey. New Jersey? Yes. If the maze is still in the US, it will be a true sensation. It will give us a chance to return the relic home. I came to Howell, New Jersey. Here the descendants of the Kuban Kozak immigrants settled. They continue their traditions and still choose their leaders. The last of them, Alexander Pevnyov, is also a museum custodian. May I come in? Please come in. Alexander Mikhailovich, I know you have unique maces in your collection. I saw the pictures. One of the maces was attributed to Bogdan Khmelnytsky. I think this is true. May I see? No. We don't have them now. We send them back home. Where? To Russia. Why not Ukraine? Why Ukraine? I don't even want to discuss this. I sent it where it needed to be. They went back to where they came from. In 2005, the museum was contacted by the Cossack organizations from Russia. They asked to send the relics to Krasnodar. American Cossacks didn't support that and wanted to gather for discussion. But a few days before that, cars with the Russian diplomatic plates came to the museum. All the valuables were loaded and transported to the Russian consulate in New York and then to Russia by plane. They hit a hat with the money. Pivnyov acknowledged that they financially supported the community and paid 40,000 US dollars or 100,000. No one knows where that money is. And now all these things are all these things are in Russia, in Krasnodar. Did you see them there? Of course, more than once. They were there and they are still there. Two years ago, I saw them in Moscow. Gokhran was their primary destination in Russia. 
Russians believe all these things have to be under their control. That is why they created this Gokhran department. There are no analogues in the world. It is, in fact, a cemetery of all the historical relics that Moscow doesn't want to show. Even a century later, Gokhran got the treasures that slipped through their fingers in the turbulent 1920s. They are off-limits now, and we cannot check if the maze belonged to Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Despite the words of the first Cossack immigrants from the Kuban and some researchers, the U.S. relic is visually different from the maze on the Hetman's lifetime icon. We have the crime, we know the criminal, we know the motive, we only miss the evidence. We are seemingly powerless against a Gokhran monster that can be stopped by distance or other countries' borders, but not all is lost. Since the end of 1980s, one person persistently tracks national treasures. This man picked the smallest bits of information and finally caught the mistake of the thieves who tried to cover the fraud with the Ukrainian relics. His name is Grigory Polushko. For more than 30 years he worked in the depositories of Kyiv Pechersk Lavra. Hi. Hi. I have information about Hetman's golden feather. Golden feather? Yes. It is on display in the historical museum in Moscow. I was there and saw it. Here are proofs and documents. Hetman's feather was taken to Russia along with the thousands of other Ukrainian relics. Perhaps Khmelnytsky's mace and a chest with Razumovsky's heart got there too. But only a feather has left some trace which reveals the fraud with the valuables. Secret department, archive documents, classified and top secret. These are the evidence that it's been kept there illegally. First, Khmelnytsky's feather ended up in Kyiv Pechers Klavra. Due to the criminal situation in Kyiv, the museum managers transferred it to the state bank office. The only reason being they had strong boxes for temporary keeping. In what bank? Kyiv office was a branch of a Soviet state bank. It had to report to Moscow about everything they received. Probably after the report they received an order from Moscow. So they sent these things to Gohan. The final proof of the illegal transfer, an inquiry from the State Moscow Historical Museum to Gohan with a request to transfer Hetman's feather to their exposition. When I was on a business trip to Moscow, I saw that these are our artifacts, but they present it as their own. So what can we get from these documents today? We have the right to demand the return of these valuables from Russia. So our reports are not in vain. The facts we found out during the investigation gave us a chance to return lost artifacts and renew the historical truth. Different fragments already fall into one picture. Kirill Rozumovsky was looking for Khmelnytsky's mace, a relic that was supposed to unite people for the uprising. He solved one of the main secrets. The Ryaslav Treaty, which chained Ukraine to Russia, doesn't exist. For his bravery in this fight, Hetman's brothers-in-arms embalmed his heart as a symbol of a nation struggling for freedom. His contribution during the short period of 40-year-long rule couldn't be underestimated. He did a lot to renew Ukraine's sovereignty and independence. The history of heroes and relics was erased. A different truth was sown on the burned land. This false truth grew up as an arch of friendship in the consciousness of the millions of people.
Historian needs a document to prove if something had happened or not, if there were signages or weren't, for ideological purposes. The most important is psychology of influence. Works of imagination might become a reality. All you need is to replicate that in the imaginations of other people. It works like hypnosis. In 1954, the unification of Russia and Ukraine in a blink of an eye became the biggest celebration in USSR. Here comes the delegation of a brotherly Russian nation, together forever. Pompeo's ceremonies took place in the 15 republics. People dancing in the streets didn't realize that their feelings and emotions were constructed. Famous psychiatrist and medical doctor Oleg Chaban explained how this worked. This was a festive celebration of an event that never happened. The first step is what we see – symbols. Look, 1654 and 1954. Russia is, of course, in the center. Kremlin, Moscow. And here's our Bogdan showing the direction to Russia with his maze. It was massive. The second step is what we hear – mottos. These words, together forever, are everywhere. Motto has to be clear and easily remembered. Two words, together forever, together forever, together forever. The shorter it is, the easier to remember. The third step is to block critical thinking, add a couple of true facts into a lie. The costumes are accurate, and the footwear is accurate. In the picture everything is accurate. Why would you have any doubts? Together forever. The fourth step – individual approach. From a kid in the kindergarten to a grandma in the kitchen, from a worker to a professor. No one is left out. Here it says, on the production and delivery to the trade organization of the goods in a special jubilee packaging dedicated to 300 years of the Union of Ukraine and Russia. It is all strictly regulated who should produce what and how. Everyone had to follow these regulations. Also, the annexes are just appalling. This order was classified. Everything we use every day, we wear and buy for our children, absolutely everything, should have been wrapped up in the ideological message. How do you show the idea of a three-century jubilee of the Union in confectionery goods? Here they have it, confectionery goods. Lollipops packed in the 100-gram tin boxes, 400,000 boxes. Tell me, who would ever throw away a tin box? Never. True. So the lollipop tin with a picture of Hetman and the Union motto stayed in the family for a long time. The fifth step, and the most cynical, invasion of privacy. A woman or a girl buying an intimate item, something she wears close to her body at night. She's still wearing symbols, 300 years, together forever. She literally puts these words close to her heart. This effect on consciousness was so powerful that even today, after several generations, the together forever virus still infects millions. The importance of facts and documents, which we collected while making the film, has made our investigation far more critical than just a documentary. We want to give all the evidence in the hands of the state. We meet the Minister of Culture, Yevhen Nishchuk. Hi, very nice to meet you. The government has the power to resolve this issue at the bilateral level. These artifacts belonged to our hetmans, which is the most important thing. Yes, it is not about the material value of the artifacts, but their symbolic and practical meaning. These are bridges that connect our history with our modernity.
They will always remind us about our identity. Bogdan Khmelnytsky was wearing this. It is a vital artifact in our history. We have undeniable evidence that it is in Russia, and it got there illegally. There were some manipulations in state banks and secret depositories. These things were extracted and were not declared. It is a very cunning scheme. I thank your team. I think that with these materials we can form a working group and defend our rights to these treasures, either with agreements or in court. My prognosis is that it will likely be a court case with the Russian Federation. The first step is made. After many decades, we finally have a real chance to return our history. Other people turned years, events, names, all that made us into faceless inventory numbers in secret vaults. For those who never knew freedom, the heart of the last Cossack hetman is just another stolen artifact. This is my personal story, but also it's the history of the whole country. We have to remember who we are, to understand why we are here and where we go. Nation's treasures must go back home and be the foundation of our new history, without mythologies and lies. This history is about Ukraine. Cossack history is the most vital foundation. If we stand on it and take everything we need from them, we can rise up.